Carpenter's Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. So today, I'm going to be preaching a message I have titled, The Good Fight of Faith. Let's do it one more time. I've missed doing that, actually. The good fight of faith. Amen. Amen. This is a message that I believe we need to hear now. And when I'm done with it, in the first service I said November. I forgot there was October. So when I'm done with it, in October we'll continue. Um, abundant resources on every side. Amen. Amen. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is a popular verse of scripture. A lot of us have heard it before that we need to fight the good fight of faith. And it was an instruction given by Paul to Timothy. Question, was it only meant for Timothy? Huh? Does it apply to you as well? We know that Paul also said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, that he has fought a good fight. He has finished the race, finished the course, and so on and so forth. He has kept the faith. So we know that it applied to Paul, and Paul was applying it to Timothy. Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 1, 17, that the just shall live by faith. Who is the just? If you're just, let me see your hands up. So if you're righteous, you're born again, you're a child of God, you are the just. And it says here, the just shall live by faith. Or in the original text, the, the just shall live by his faith. So if faith is something you're supposed to live by, like oxygen, for you as a child of God, then I think you want to know as much as you can know about the fight of faith. Amen. So this is not just for Timothy, this is for every believer. We've got to find out how to fight the good fight of faith. So we're going to be looking at some things today and next week um, most likely we'll round it up on this. The first point we're going to look at is this. The fight of faith is just that. It's a fight that you have to fight. So it's called a good fight of faith. You know, as a believer, sometimes you wish you could delete that word fight and put another word, put an encounter of faith, adventure of faith. It says fight. So if it says fight, it's what? I can't hear you. It's a fight you are meant to fight. Fight the good fight of faith. So it's a fight you are meant to fight. If somebody invites you to a dance and there is a ballroom where you're coming in to dance, you look very funny if you come into that dance room and you start fighting, right? They're likely going to throw you out. Or there is a boxing ring where you're expected to go in and fight. And you go there and start doing what? Dancing. Again, they will just throw you out of the ring and say, this guy is not serious. So it's not a dance room where you go in and fight. Neither is it a boxing ring where you go in and dance. It's a fight where you are called to fight. Amen. So this is for you as a believer. And sometimes as believers, when we hear things like this, we think, ah, but you know, has grace not provided everything for me? Oh, certainly. And sometimes we mix up the grace message and we don't realize that there is a balance to grace and faith. Grace has provided everything for you, but there is a place for faith. And we're discovering today that you're expected to fight this fight of faith. Now, if you learn how to fight, if you learn what to fight with, then you have the victory. So it's not just fight. They said I should fight, so let me start fighting. No, slow down. Now you're going to learn how to fight, what you're supposed to fight with, and then you can say, I won this fight of faith. Glory be to God. But it is just that. It is a fight that you have to fight. What does fight mean from the dictionary? Just as a wake-up call before we start looking at the Greek. It means to take part 
in a violent struggle involving the exchange of physical blows or the use of weapons. How many of us have had a, been involved in a fight before? And the way your hand went up fast at the back. And he says, sister, these are the last days. I have to try and see if she's married. Because if she is, I have to explore. The hand, I hardly had the definition out of my mouth. Her hand went up. But you see, she's truthful. A lot of you that, how many of you have been involved in a fight? Now, the women raising their hands, they are troubled. Like last week's message, this is trouble. Huh? And some of us way back in primary school and secondary school, we were the school bully. Some of us were proud of it. <laughs> and you go to the, to the playground and they know you there. Just deliver one blow. Say, that can't be for us as Christians. Well, it says fight. It says fight, the good fight of faith. And in that verse, we see the word fight appear two times. Fight the good fight. So the first appearance is, in ver is a verb, and the second appearance is a what? Noun. So there is a fight, you are called to fight. And in that fight, you do what? You fight. So let's look at the words that, you know, are used in the Greek. Fight, the verb, is the Greek word agonizomai. A-G-O-N-I. Z-O-M-A-I. There are different morphs of this word, but this is the base word. Agonizomai. A-G-O-N-I. Z-O-M-A-I. And it means to struggle. Remember, this is the fight you are called to fight. And look at the words. To struggle. Pastor, am I supposed to struggle as a believer? To compete for a prize. To contend with an adversary. To endeavor to accomplish something. To struggle. To compete for a prize. To contend with an adversary. To endeavor to accomplish something. To labor fervently. To strive. To contend against opposition and temptation. To contend against opposition and temptation. Agonizomai refers to a great exertion or effort. I'm not sure I said this in the first service. A great exertion or effort. Fight, church. Brother, fight. Sister, fight. The good fight of faith. Agonizomai. Struggle. Contend for a prize. Labor fervently. Exert an effort. What word do you think comes from this word? What English word do you think is derived from this word? Huh? Agony. Agony. Say, Pastor, are you coming to tell us to get into agony? I'm just showing you what's in the Bible, and we can find out from there what we're supposed to do. Agony is extreme physical or mental suffering, anguish, pain, distress. Agony. From the dictionary now. Extreme physical or mental suffering, anguish, pain, distress. So let's look at two places where agonizomai is used. I mean, if you're called to do something, don't you want to find out about that thing? Huh? So that word agonizomai is what Paul is saying you should do as a believer. Well, let's look at two other places where agonizomai is used. And maybe we can begin to see the meaning of that word more clearly. Colossians 1, 27 to 29. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory 
of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. So Paul is saying, this is the mystery. This is the great news I have for you. Hey, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. And he goes on to say, him who? Him we preach. Who is the him? Talk to me. Who? Christ. Christ we preach. Warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What does that mean that we may present? It means the whole purpose of his preaching and his teaching is to present you perfect in Christ Jesus. Correct? So each time he climbed the stage, each time he went to the synagogue to preach, each time I come up here to preach, each time Pastor Shola is here to preach, or any other pastors visiting or in-house, we're all here to do what? Preach Christ to you. Tell you Christ is in you, the hope of glory, that we may present you perfect. That's the purpose. But Paul does not stop there. He goes on in verse 29, and he says, to this end, what end? This same purpose, this same reason why I preach, I don't stop at just preaching. To this end, I also labor, striving agonizomai. I also agonizomai according to his working, his energy, which works energy in me mightily according to dynamis in me. So Paul is saying, after I preach, I engage the power of God to agonizomai over you. To fight the good fight of faith over you. To pray over you for the same purpose that when I preach and tell you that Christ is in you, I want to see Christ actually expressed and manifested in you. I want to see you mature. I want to see you reach the fullness of your faith. So after I preach and I step down, I go down and I agonizomai over you. If Paul and your pastors agonizomai over you, shouldn't you do that over yourself? So Paul is saying it's not enough to just come and sit down and hear the word. What do you do with the word? How do you wage your warfare according to the prophecies that have gone before you? According to the things that have been said about you? That's that word there. Look at it again in Colossians 4. Still Paul speaking. Verse 12. Speaking about Epaphras, who was basically the pastor of the Colossi church. Epaphras, who is one of you, a born servant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently agonizomai. Always laboring fervently agonizomai for you in prayers. Why? Same reason that you may stand perfect and complete. It seems to me that you cannot stand perfect and complete. It seems to me that you cannot fully mature in the faith. It seems to me that you cannot see the fullness of any faith project without agonizomai being involved. And again, what is agonizomai? It's a struggle. It's a fight. It's a competition to get the price. It's labor. It's effort. It's exerting some energy according to the dunamis that is at work in you. But grace has provided everything. There must be a balance for God to tell you and for all his servants, men of God, to be agonizomine over the word they have preached. There must be something God expects you to do and that's to fight the good fight of faith. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. That term comes from the sports games that the Greeks were known for in ancient times. The Greeks were known for the athletics, the Olympias, the Ithemias, the different, different names of competitions they had at different seasons. And in those competitions, they had horse races, they had boxing fights, they had you know, racing with your leg, they had um, um, wrestling fights. They were very into sports, and the Romans would come and watch them do their sports. And what the athlete went through was called agonizomai. The athlete was trained, and actually the Greeks began to train their children from like six or seven years old. They would take two boys, strip them naked, oil their bodies, and throw them in the, out at each other, maybe in the desert, under the hot sun. And these boys would start to fight. 
and they will let them fight till one gets to the ground, probably covered in blood, and one is the winner. And they take them up again, train them some more, and throw them again, preparing them for the games. That's agonizomai. So Paul is talking to Timothy, and if you know your Bible, Timothy's father was Greek. So Paul is using something that Timothy can relate to. And he says, you know how your people, your father's people, you know, they fight, and they have all these games, and they, they're ready to kill themselves if necessary, and they train them from when they are young to get the prize. That is how you have to contend for the faith. That is how you have to fight to get the prize. That is where that term comes from church and how very unpentecostal it is for many of us to begin to hear that there is a place for us to agonizomai we just sit around so some believers we've caught the revelation of the message of grace and we expect God to just drop things on our laps like Father Christmas and we have no role to play Paul says no you've got to fight the good fight of faith. The second place that word fight is used is used as a noun. Fight, agonizomai, the good fight. That word, second word fight is a noun. And that's the word agon. So you can see it's basically the same thing. So agonizomai, the good agon of faith. Agon means a place of assembly where a contest is held. A fight, a race. A conflict, yes. It's where fights took place. So Agon speaks of the conflict or the contest or the place or the race that you are agonizomine under. So this is an Agon of faith. You've got to fight the Agon of faith. So there is a boxing ring for that faith project. There is a race set before you. And it says you've got to fight that contest of your faith. Is somebody with me, church? Is this good news? Oh, yes, it is. We're getting to the good news part, the better news part. Oh, I'm supposed to fight. Yes. Let's look at two places where agon is used. Colossians 2, verse, from verse 1 to 5. For I want you to know what a great conflict, agon. That's the word agon. What a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now what is this conflict? I want you to understand the picture of agonizomai and agon. Again, Paul speaking. What is this conflict? That their hearts may be encouraged. So Paul wants their hearts to be encouraged. He has a, a conflict. He has a fight. Being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Hey, Paul is saying, in the Father are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But of what use are they staying in the Father? says, no, I want them to be expressed in you. It's like our message, God is big in you. But it says, I need to labor. There's a context. I want your heart to be encouraged. I want you to walk in love so that those treasures that grace has deposited for you, you can do what? access them but he says I have to I have to struggle I have to labor there's a contest for you is somebody getting this okay so he goes on to say in whom are hidden all the treasures Woo! treasures of wisdom and knowledge all hidden for us not from us now this I say lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words for though I am absent in the flesh Yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Paul was a great guy. He didn't just preach and teach. He didn't just go back and follow up his converts. He agonized over them. Glory be to God. And taught them to do the same. 
over themselves, taught the pastors to do the same over their sheep. Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2 is another place where agon, is, my, agon rather, is used. We're looking at agon now, the noun. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, like this microphone I'm carrying, lay it aside and use this one. And the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance. The race, what word is that? Agon. Let us run the contest set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him, he had his own agon, endured the cross, that's how he ran it, despising the shame, and now has sat down, he's gotten the prize, at the right hand of the throne of God. So just like he ran his race, we have a race before us, we have an agon before us, and you don't run that agon dancing in the boxing ring, you run it fighting where you are called to fight. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. So I told you that the Greek people started early to train their children. May I say that we should do the same as believers. Let us start early to train our children to fight the good fight of faith. Let us start early to train our children to trust God and believe him. You may have everything. Don't hand everything to your children. Sometimes you give them certain things they don't need at a particular age, you destroy them. Teach them to believe God. Teach them to agonizomai. Teach them to trust him. And thank God for the TC Cubs. Can we clap for the TC Cubs, people? <laughs> thank God our children's church is not a nanny house. Thank God they are invested. They, there's investment of materials and training. And they teach them the Bible. Many parents have testimonies of how they are going through a journey of faith. And it is their children who reminds them what the word of God says. Anybody had that kind of testimony? Oh yes, your baby tells you, four-year-old, five-year-old baby tells you. You know, um, I got a letter from Pastor Cassie's children recently. They are so smart, it's ridiculous. And they're not just smart, they are spiritually smart. You and Patricia have done a good job. Not just because you are a pastor, Patricia is a children's church worker as well. So I'm sure she does that at home as well with the kids. I mean, his, his daughter, how old is your daughter? She's five. That girl talks like she's 15. She told me she loves me. She loves the word I teach. But she also loves my dresses and my makeup. So she's a very balanced child. She loves me. She loves what I teach. Everything I teach them. She loves my makeup and she loves my dresses. I have to be very careful how I dress because I've got a five-year-old watching me. And as for Shazek, Shazek, his son, I mean, he just talks like he was born inside the Bible. It's not just what's happening at home, it's what's happening in there as well. Those kids will be faced with some conflict. They will know what to say. They will know what to do. That is just like the seven-year-old Greek boys they throw out in the desert and throw them at each other. They're training them to agonizomai. You don't get up at 35 and start to try to fight the good fight of faith. It doesn't work that way. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. So let's go on. So that's agonizomai and agon. But we're not talking about wrestling matches here. We're not talking about horse races. We're talking about what? The fight of faith. The fight of faith. So to get to the end of any path of faith, or any journey of faith, there must be a fight. That's great news I have for you. If you thought there was any other shortcut of getting to the end of any path of faith or any journey of faith, you're not reading your Bible well. There must be a fight. I'll say it again. To get to the end of any path of faith or any journey of faith, there must be a fight. What is this fight? Write down four things. It's a fight to ensure we please God in all we do. 
breaking down the fight of faith now. What are you really fighting for? One, without faith it's impossible to please God. So it is a fight to ensure that all you do pleases God. There is agonism in that. Because there are parts of you that want to do things that don't please God. There's agony many times to parts of you when you want to do other things. But the good fight of faith is a fight to ensure that all you do pleases the Father. All you say, all you think. I was talking to a sister recently and she was saying how she was upset in a way at God at something that happened to her. And she now came full circle, I counseled with her and she was fine. But then she made this statement, she said, ah, thank God I never said it out, what I was feeling about God. Thank God I kept it in me. So I laughed. I said, I guess you think God doesn't know. God knows before you say it. The minute you think it, he does what? He knows it. In fact, you don't want to speak it out for yourself. It's really for your sake and for the enemy not to have something to use against you. But you're speaking it out is not when God hears it. Oh, I didn't say it. So, ha, thank God. I've repented before I said it. Hello, God is spirit. Jesus says if you just think about lusting after a woman, he has counted it as adultery. You just thought about it. So I said to her, even when you are thinking about it, God has finished, he has heard it. Some of you look very troubled. Oh, really? Yes. So it's a fight of faith to make sure you please God in your thoughts, in your speech, in your actions, in all that you do because without faith it's impossible to please him. Second, it's a fight to ensure that we grow and mature in the faith. We've seen that with Paul. To the end that you may mature, to the end that I may present you. That's the desire of every pastor. I may present you perfect. I may present you mature. Not just teaching the word. It's a fight to present you mature. So to ensure that you grow and mature in the faith. Am I going too fast? No, I'm not. Good. Listen, number three. It's a fight to preserve the purity of the faith and the undiluted word in us. It's a fight to ensure the purity of the faith and the undiluted word in us. The faith has been diluted so much in these last days. The word has been diluted so much in these last days. Thank God we have the undiluted word here. But are you fighting the fight of faith to preserve the purity of that word? Or at a storm, does the word get impure? Does the word get diluted? Do you start looking for options? When you fight the good fight of faith, you preserve the purity of your faith. We're going to find out next week that Paul says, I have kept the faith. I fought a good fight. I finished my race. But listen to what he said. Listen, listen. Paul was basically saying, the faith that Jesus arrested me on the road to Damascus and gave to me in that same purity, have I given it to you? And with that same purity, am I laying down my baton? The faith I received on the road to Damascus is the faith I gave to all the churches. I didn't add anything to it. It grew, but it remained pure and undiluted. And now I have finished my course, and it is the same faith. I'm going to the master with glory be to God. May that be your testimony. May you finish your course with a pure faith. May you finish your course with an undiluted faith. May the purity of your faith be preserved and be kept until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Christian race. That is the fight of faith. To preserve the purity. It is not just to be a Christian and come to church. It is to have the purity of your faith preserved. To be able to say like Paul, I have kept the faith. There are ministers who began with the faith, but they have not kept the faith. Their churches are big. People are following them. But the faith is rotten. It is diluted. In this church, we will preserve the faith. We'll keep the purity of the faith. We will not dilute the word of God even with a drop 
of ink. That is why we fight the good fight of faith. That is why we fight the good fight of faith, to preserve the purity of our faith. I will give up anything that needs to be given up, even my life, to keep the purity of the faith. To keep the... <laughs> <laughs> the word to you. I received the word from Jesus, but I received it through my man of God, Pastor Charles Omofoma. I didn't know anything when I met him. And the word he delivered to me was a pure, undiluted word. And thank God, 27 years later, that is the same word that is being delivered to you. And I will get to a point Either Jesus comes, I'll be old, and I'll be able to stand before the congregation and say, I have fought a good fight, I've finished my course, and I have kept the faith. I preserved it. Nobody took it away. Nobody diluted it. No matter how the days turned, no matter how the last days turned, I kept the faith, if need be, with the last breath. I had. That is why you fight the good fight of faith. You preserve and you keep the faith. The fourth reason why you fight, it's a fight to enable you access all, all, everybody say all, all that his grace has provided for you. All that his grace has provided for you. So in all of this agonism I talk, we see there is effort in fighting the fight of faith. So it means, church, that lazy Christians, spiritually overweight Christians, untrained Christians cannot fight this fight. Can you imagine a child who when they took him to the desert at seven years old, to fight, sat down and said, I don't want to fight. Give me Pringles. I don't want to fight, I want to drink Fanta. And he never fought. And all his mates were developing muscles and getting trained, and he refused to fight. Some of us Christians are like that. Why are some churches flourishing with diluted word? In fact, there's no word again. Just talk. Head, no head. There are some preachers who don't use a Bible at the pulpit, and you're not, so, you're not concerned. Me as a pastor, let me just say this. I'm concerned if I see you in the congregation, you don't have a Bible. You may have a phone that has a Bible. Awesome. But when I see people in church who just sit down like this, I'm like Man Zion that cannot be moved. And the word is, you didn't come to church with your Bible. But you dressed up, you made up, you came. You even have your Bible, you're not taking notes. I don't even push that anymore because some people want to listen and buy the tape. I hope you can end up buying it. Or listening. I don't even bother you anymore. Because now technology has moved people that they don't write again. But you don't even come with a Bible. Just Igbaleka, you sit down like that. And you are looking. I'm concerned. Now, shouldn't you be concerned if I come up here without a Bible? And I come up here and I preach to you. I talk to you and I don't, use, I don't open a Bible. There are churches now. Even large, major churches in America that the pastors don't bother bringing Bibles to the pulpit anymore. You should be concerned. But we have lazy believers who don't even own Bibles. You can't fight. They throw you into the ring. <laughs> Before they even start the fight, you are out. Just one. Hey. Your opponent will not even need to box you. You just go, ha. Ah. You say, hey. And you take off. Lazy, overweight. You say, ah, what does it mean to be an overweight Christian? A lot of you are overweight, spiritually. You've been coming to church for 10 years, 15 years. You do nothing in church. You take no faith adventures. You take no risks. How do you think you develop muscles? How do you think you develop stamina? You take a risk. 
the first time you go on the treadmill, you do 10 minutes. After a month, if you are still doing treadmill, something do you. Move it to 15 minutes. Push yourself a little more. Move it a little more. At some point, move it from walking to running. At some point, change the incline and move it to running uphill. You keep pushing it. You keep pushing it. You get to a point where your, your health says, stop here. Fine, stop there. Then push yourself in some other area. Pick up a weight, put it down. Pick up a weight, put it down. But you can't just sit in church for 20 years hearing the word of God and you have no faith adventures and therefore you have no faith victories. The day something hits you big, it will knock you out flat. That's overweight. So you are all fed with the word. In fact, fed up with the word. But you take no risk. You don't sow anything more than 10% of your tithe. You take no risk financially. You take no risk with your health. You have the mildest headache. You pop all the pills, you know all of them. You pop them like a cocktail. It's a headache. Take a faith adventure. Bring out some of that fat you've been listening to for 20 years and apply it. Attempt and see if the headache will go. And if it goes, you've developed one small pinky muscle. Then take another one. You hear a message on giving, take a risk and just give, give. Young lady, Pastor Tony called me, and I know all of us gave very well. I didn't tell you this actually, I, did, I said it in the first service. Thank God for the offering we took for him both services. God had told me from the beginning, but I just didn't say that that day, that whenever we finish taking the offering, whatever offering we gathered for him, the church would match it. That's double it. So what we collected, first and second service, I waited till Friday, because some of you are still bringing... By Friday, we closed the offering and we wrote a check times two that offering. And I told him in a letter, the reason we are doing that is that Steno Correo and Thelipsis, no more in this church. Not only does the Bible say double honor for a man of God, but we are giving trouble, double kum kum. For those of them who knock their children's heads, we, we, we actually used to pull the ear, so we're giving trouble. You pull one ear, turn the other ear. Trouble. Double. Amen. Where was I? Fine, that day. Huh? A sister, yes. And, and she gave her entire salary. Just took removed her tithe, gave her entire salary to the man of God. She has developed some serious muscles. She's not overweight, she's not obese. She's taking some steps. If you stay in the comfort zone and stay in the safe zone always, you cannot win any faith victories. Lazy people, you are untrained in the word of righteousness, unskilled. That means there is skill to using the word. There is, and we're going to find out those skills. There is skill, method in using the word of God to fight. But you're untrained. You're unskilled. You don't use the word. You come to church and that's the end of Solomon Grundy till next Sunday. Thursday cannot see you, even if it is not raining. Tuesday, hi. Hi. How do you want to labor fervently in prayer if you can't even pray in Tuesday prayer meeting? Then when a storm, Hurricane Adamu, hits you. You cannot. Eh? Hurricane Belema is the next one. Hey, you know, they name it in a better order. What do you do before Chukuma comes? You cannot handle those storms when they start hitting you. Because you are fat, untrained, lazy, and unskilled. But that's not you in Jesus' name. So, question. Can anyone fight this fight for you? Can anyone fight your fight for you? Pastor, pray for me. Pastor, it's like you're not praying for me. You, are you praying for me? I can pray for you, you can pray for me, but you've got to fight your fight of faith. Paul says, I finished my course. It's my course. Everybody has their course. Chiabu cannot fight Joan's course for her. Joan cannot fight Chiabu's course for him. They can fight together if it concerns their children or a project, project as a family, but it is course. When my health was challenged, every step of the way right up till today, 
Emeka is excellent, great support, best husband in the whole universe and planet. But he can't fight my cause for me. He can support me, create an enabling environment for me. But the day I stop fighting the fight of faith, that's the end of it. There is nothing he can do. It's your fight. So that's the answer to the question. Nobody can fight it for you. Your husband may be Arnold Schwarzenegger. If you're overweight, you won't win your fight. He can't fight it for you. I said he can't fight it for you. And this is something a lot of pastor spouses need to hear. Sometimes pastor spouses are the most carnal, the most unspiritual people that exist. Sometimes. Why? My husband or my wife is a pastor. So they take care of business. You're on a plane. Ah, my husband is on this plane. Nothing will happen. Are you not on the plane? You, are you not on the plane? Nobody can fight that fight for you. Don't be hiding under the covering of your husband's anointing or your wife's anointing. Because let me tell you something. Even your husband or your wife who is a pastor does not fight the fight of faith by their anointings. They fight it by their own fight of faith, which has nothing, zero, nothing to do with the grace of God upon their lives. Uh -uh. Am I not anointed? Am I not anointed? Am I not appointed? Am I not anointed and appointed? So why did faith cha hell challenge come to me? As hell challenge just came, the anointing of God and the call of God and the appointment of God upon my life, we don't knock it down first five minutes. I had to walk my own walk of faith. And I was coming from a place where I had overworked myself, so I was in low, low level. So I had to build myself up rapidly by my own fight of faith. There was no anointing helping me. There was no extra call helping me. If anything, it was a hindrance because I still had to do the things I was doing. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? It's your fight, church. It's your fight, brother. It's your fight, sister. Nobody can fight it for you. Second question, is there a way out of this fight? Is there a way out of this fight? Tell me, is there a way out? Is there a way out? No? Did you say no? Are you saying something? You have to fight it. So you're saying there's no way out. There are two ways out. One way out is to fight it and finish it. And then that fight is done. The next way out is to give up. Just succumb. Just say, I beg, I don't do it again. Throw in the towel. And many have done that. We don't judge them. But they got away from the fight. So that means you can only get out of the fight either as a winner or as a loser. You can't decide you're not going to have a fight before you. There is a fight set before you. There is a race set before you. There is an agon set before you. As long as you are just, you are a child of God, it comes with the package. It's what you do with that agon that matters and how you do it. It's whether you are diligent, you are developed or not. Glory be to God. So number two, I said number one, the fight of faith is just that. Did I say that? I said it, right? It's a fight that you have to fight. Second point, the fight of faith is a good fight. And everybody said, yay! That's some good news. It's a good fight. Paul could just have said, fight the fight of faith. Would that have been correct? Yes. Yes. I think he didn't want to spook Timothy too much by saying, agonizomai, the agon of faith. Hey, Timothy would say, I don't enter. Because he understood the games. He understood the Greek games. But he said, agonizomai, the good agon. That word good is not the word agathos, which is often used for good in the Bible. And that means something that is intrinsically good. This is a word kalos. And it means many interesting things. 
But one of the most important things to me that it means, it means beautiful. Carlos. Now begin to think about it. An agonizing fight that is beautiful. There must be something that Paul knows. Beautiful. Valuable. Virtuous. Honorable. Noble. Exceptional. Of the highest quality. Did I say all of this? Outstanding or superb. In the context of a fight, in the context of a fight, it denotes one, right please, it denotes one who has given his best, it denotes one who has given his best to the fight in which he's engaged. Hence, doing a first-rate or first-class job of resisting his opponents. In the context of a fight, it denotes one who has given his best to the fight in which he's engaged. Hence, doing a first-rate or first-class job of resisting his opponents. So why does Paul call this a good fight? Why does Paul call this a good fight? A, number one, under that, number two. The technique used in this fight is a beautiful technique. Remember, Carlos means beautiful, means valuable, means virtuous, outstanding, first class. Wow. We've been called to an exceptional fight, not to a moi moi fight. We've been called to a high grade fight. The technique used in this fight is a beautiful technique. I want to read 1 Timothy 6.12 from the Kenneth Woost translation. I've introduced you to Kenneth Woost. I hope you've found his Bible. Listen to this, please. Be constantly engaging. So you see, it's a continuous thing. You can't say, I've fought one fight. I'm not fighting it again. As long as you live by faith, you keep fighting fights of faith. And you keep getting the victory. I said, and you keep getting the victory. Okay? Be constantly engaging in the contest of the faith. Which contest is marked by its beauty of technique? Wow. You didn't hear that. Be constantly engaging in the contest of the faith. In other words, fight the good fight of faith. But it goes on. It's good because which contest is marked? Listen. The fight is marked by its beauty of technique. Take possession of the eternal life into a participation of which you were called and concerning which you gave testimony to your agreement with the good profession you made in the presence of many witnesses. That's 1 Timothy 6.12 from the Kenneth Woods translation. So why is it a good fight? It has a beautiful technique. Church, what is the beautiful technique? What is the technique? Strategy. I was telling them in the first service how when I was in the US during the whole hurricane something, where it's stuck at home now, it's still down in the house for three days or something. So Nkechi was now just checking the television, trying to follow the hurricane. And I now saw a fight that was going to happen between two people called, uh, you know them now, Uncle Ike, you know now, Mayweather and uh, Chris, you know, see all of you, see all your life. See your life, all of you. <laughs> they call it to fight the fight of faith, not McGregor and... But meanwhile, I was watching it too. McGregor and Mayweather. Money, when Mayweather was the champion, right? And he was the guy who was all mouth and rotten mouth and terrible mouth. M McGregor was, the content, was trying to collect the rather ambitious Oibo man. So, Mayweather had a technique. That's my point. 
he had a strategy. He knew what he was going to do. Now, McGregor was talking plenty. You see, it's good to talk plenty if you have power behind you talking. If you don't have power, that talking may not help you. But he was talking plenty. Mayweather did not talk too much. But what was his technique? He was going to wait for McGregor to be tired. He had checked and he knew that McGregor couldn't last a long fight. And he can last as long as he wants to. He's a boy raised in the hood. So he can last. So what did he do? He came out for the fight. Like I was telling them in the first service, I wanted to watch the fight. Okay, note that I did not watch wrestling fights. I was just bored indoors because of hurricane. So I begged my husband that please, we should buy the fights on television so that we can watch it. He said, why do you want to watch fight? You will start practicing on me. <laughs> Already you used to do some strange things. I'm not going to buy this fight for you. I said, please, I'm bored now. Please, I'm inside this house. Hurricane is outside. Please buy me the fight. So as a loving husband, he picked up the phone to buy the fight with his card in hand to pay for his baby. Who wants to watch a wrestling match? <laughs> Boxing match, terrible. Well, who, I might now practice the skills I learned on him. <laughs> so he picked up the phone to call. And when he picked up the phone, they told him, yes, yes, the fight is available. This was the, the, day, the day of the fight. A few hours to the fight, Steph. A few hours to the fight, Saturday. Hurricane had landed. So they told him the money was $4.99. So he was very happy. It's $5. So he brought out his card to pay $5. And they told him, confirm that it is a $499.99. $499.99. Which is how much? So when he heard it, the Igbo man in my husband, quite prudently so, held the phone away from the man's voice and said, do you really want to watch this fight? <laughs> I said, why? He said, it's $500. He was now matched by the evil woman in me. He said, Ta! Drop the phone. <laughs> we'll watch television later and find out what happened. <laughs> Which is exactly what we did. <laughs> $500 to watch Mayweather destroy McGregor? No, no. I don't love it that much. I was not that bored. <laughs> and we now watched the thing and saw that the guy had a technique. That's my point. He had a strategy. He let McGregor bounce around the place. He even let him deal him some blows. And we'll talk about this next week. But when the guy was getting tired, what happened? Attack. He crushed him to the point that the referee had to blow the whistle. So the guy would not destroy his life and his future. There has to be a technique or a strategy for any fight to be a good fight. Amen. And for us in the body of Christ, what is our technique? Number one, believe the word of God. Quickly now. Number one, believe the word of God. Mark 11, 22 to 24. You must believe the word of God. You look at that, body, that tumor in your body, believe the word of God. Look at your husband packing out of the house, believe the word of God. Let God's word be final authority. Yet another period has shown up this month. Believe the word of God. In the face of adversity, Believe the word of God. In the face of trouble, believe nothing else but the word of God. Pure, undiluted word of God. That is technique. That is callous beauty in the fight. Number two, meditate the word of God. 1 Timothy 4.15. Because of time, I won't read it. Meditate the word of God. I'm giving you the techniques in summarized form. If not, this message will be 10 parts. Meditate the word of God. Number three, speak the word of God. What you believe, what you've meditated on will come out of your mouth. Speak the word of God. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the situation. Declare the word of God over the situation. That is the technique that wins the fight. That is what makes the fight a good fight. Speak the word of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 13. We have the same spirit of faith. It's been tried and tested. If we believe, we speak. If I hold my tongue, I will give up the ghost. So I will not hold my tongue, therefore I will not die. Speak the word of God. Four, mix your faith with patience. Hebrews 
strategy, beautiful techniques that make you win the fight. Be constantly engaging. Don't stop. That's where patience comes in. Mix your face with patience. Number five, act on the word of God. That is for me, my, my own personal key. When I don't feel like, I get up and I do. Act on the word of God. Act on the word of God. James 2, 14 to 20. Faith without corresponding action is dead. Your faith is dead if you don't act. So believe the word of God. Meditate the word of God. Speak the word of God. Mix your faith with patience. Act on the word of God. That's the strategy. Church. That's why it's beautiful. Say, Pastor, is that it? Is that, is that so simple? Yes. Yes. Listen, listen to me. Listen, 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 listen. When I want your attention, like, I like to listen like four or five times. Listen, 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 listen. When a house is beautiful, it has very simple design lines. When you have a house that has a airplane on the top, leg is sheep. Monkey is on the gate. That house is not fine. A beautiful house is when a, an architect just designs clean, straight lines, a few curves here and there. And that's a house that lasts generations. Not heavy, heavy, mighty pillars and lion head and all those plenty things. No. That's a clean, beautiful design. A beautiful car is a simple car with sleek lines. It may be the most expensive cars are very simple in their design. I personally think Homer was a very ugly car. Or, or truck, or whatever that thing was. Very simple, clean cars. They just have simple lines and curves. A beautiful woman is one who doesn't overlabor herself with excessive makeup. Use makeup, that's fine. I use makeup. No, that's fine. But when you color, 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 so they can't find you anymore. <laughs> Where is she? Is it in the orange tone or the green tone? We can't find her anymore. Then the worst part is that you color here and you stop here. Then you wear open body and all of you. So you're like five shades. And you can't color your whole body. Otherwise you'll be rubbing people and staining their clothes. So you color your face. You, you can't do that. With the spider eyes. You can't find. Or ring, 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 ring. Somebody meets you. All they are seeing. Ring, 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 ring. Where are you? Hello? Are you there? And what is worse? As if it's your husband saying, baby, I can't find you. You don't do that. A lot of exploration going on with makeup these days. Explore gently. <laughs> Just be gentle in your explore. Explore your house and then clean it after when you come back. Because sometimes you explore so much, you look like a mom. <laughs> mom is masked. We can't find you anyway. Your husband is in shock. Was that my wife who just passed? Baby, that sounds like her. <laughs> Beautiful is simple. Beautiful is not overlabored and overladen. There's nothing against makeup. I use it and Pastor Casmer's daughter likes it. So that's fine. But that's not it. Beautiful is simple. In the same way, a beautiful technique for fighting the fight of faith is simple. Believe the word. Meditate the word. Speak the word. Mix it with patience. Act on the word. It is not a good fight of faith when you are taught to curse your enemies. That is not beautiful. It is not a good fight of faith when you are told that you have to fast 100 days before God will wake up and hear you. That is diluted. It is not beautiful anymore. It is not a good fight of faith when you have to go with your bottle of oil and without that oil, you cannot move. Some now have added blood and they use Ribena. Yes, Coke. They sprinkle their walls with Ribena or Coke as the blood of... That is... See my mouth? Uh, witchcraft. That is a juju calaba. It's witchcraft. That is not a callous fight. But unfortunately, many believers are fighting it. And you watch them and you envy them. You see now? They just had their results. See your mouth like results. What is result? She just went there and she just got pregnant. You know what she carry? You know how she carry them? That's not a beautiful fight. That's not the fight God has called you to. 
when you stay up all night, you pray at night because that is when the demons operate. Who told you that demons don't operate in the afternoon? Go to a serious traffic jam in Port Harcourt. It is demonic. It's not normal. The way some people behave, they are under the influence of demons. Demons operate 24 hours. It's when you expect them that they will see you. So you pray at night because demons, that is fear-based prayer. That is not agonizomai. But you're actually agonizing over nothing. Church, it's beautiful when it's simple. It's beautiful when it's pure. It's beautiful when it's undiluted. It's beautiful when it's in its original state. The way God handed it to you. Lastly, write this down and we'll close. So, you don't do it imaginative extraneous things add them to the word of god no it's no longer beautiful it's ugly write this down someone who is fighting a good fight therefore is someone someone who is fighting a good fight of faith therefore is someone who is using expert techniques to trounce his opponents Someone who is fighting a good fight of faith, therefore, is someone who is using expert techniques to trounce his opponents. As a believer, the opponents you face in the fight of faith are threefold. As a believer, the opponents you face in the fight of faith are threefold. Number one, yourself. You are your greatest opponent. Yourself. The state of your mind or the state of your flesh. Yourself. The more you grow in God, the more you renew your mind, the less of an opposing force yourself will be. But when you start off in training, yourself is one of your greatest opponents. Who knows that to be true? Yeah. Second opponent is others. When you worry about what they think about your fight of faith. One of the greatest liberations I've had in my life is not to bother what other people think about what I know I'm doing right with God. I have accountability partners. I have people who can check me if I go off. So I'm not saying I'm a God unto myself. But to begin to look at your face and worry about what you think about me and what I'm doing. I'm, no, you just become an opponent to me. I, I can't fight my fight of faith. So others, what they think... Some of us lose the fight because we're very concerned about how other people view our success in the fight. What other people think of us. Why is this trouble around us like we learned last week? I must have done something wrong. Then you try and prove to them you didn't do anything wrong. You are distracting yourself. The third opponent is, of course, the Satan, the enemy. Who is defeated but doesn't seem to know it. So he keeps throwing distractions at you. You pay him attention, you lose the fight. Just like Peter walking on water. You look at the storm, you lose the fight. So you want to trounce your enemies? Take your eyes off your opponents. Get your body, your flesh under. Renew your mind. Forget about what other people think. And take your eyes off the enemy and his distractions. Church, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. To fight your call to fight. But it's a good fight. It's a beautiful fight. It has techniques. Simple, beautiful techniques. Don't complicate them. Don't add things to them. Be constantly engaging those techniques. They work. I said they work. And with them, the victory is sure and settled. Lift your hands and give him praise. Give him praise. We'll continue next week. Give him praise. Give him praise. Oh, thank him for his word. Thank him. Thank him for his word. What a glorious place it is to be loved by God. To be called to fight a good fight of faith and yet have everything provided for us by grace. Everything. 
everything you ever need. So your fight is just to take what is right there in front of you, right there at your feet. Agonizomai and reach out against your flesh, against opposition. Exert the effort and reach out and take what is yours. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. I said glory be to God.